WLRN Video presents Good day, sisters. Check out this fourth installment of Getting Organized, an activist primer with Elizabeth Miller, a new monthly segment for WLRN that will give you ideas and tools to do your own feminist activism. My name is April No. WLRN Canadian member and ardent lover of dogs, trees, and everything wild, especially Angela Wild, Elizabeth's guest in this segment. Every month for Women's Liberation Radio News, Elizabeth interviews a feminist activist about her work. These interviews are meant to inspire and instruct feminists on how to organize their own activist projects. In June 2022, Elizabeth interviewed Angela about her many radical feminist projects, her feminist merchandise store, Wild Women Workshop, her grassroots radical feminist activist work in her local community, and her research work on the Get the L Out UK and Lesbian Me Too projects. Please refer to the links in the description to check out the many activist projects Angela continues to work and devote her time on. Enjoy the interview, sisters. I'm here with Angela Wilde today. She is a radical feminist who lives in Wales. And I'm going, is that right? You live in Wales, right? Yes, Wales, UK. Wales, UK. And I'm going to ask her about um, some of her feminist activism, of which there is a great deal. Um, Angela, you do a ton of different things. And the first couple things I wanted to ask you about are um, Wild Woman Workshop, what that is and why you decided to do it and how you organized it and how it's grown and what you're doing now. And then also you told me you've been doing some local activism. So I'd love to hear about that. Sure. Hello. 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 Um, so Wild Woman Workshop, it's a, it's a shop. Um, it's like generally a gift shop for feminist activists, really. Um, and I started it in 2017. The reason I did this is because very, very simply, when I wanted to find some radical feminist merchandise, there was nothing then. Uh, it was impossible to find a decent, uh, you know, even a rad fem like little badge or anything like this. And I thought, actually, it's really important. Um, I started as an activist going to mix demo and there was like a hell of a lot of Che Guevara t-shirts. And I thought, where are the feminists? You know, where, where are the women revolutionaries? And there was just not that many. So that, that's where I started and why I did this for myself to begin with, because I couldn't find it. Um, and more broadly, because I think when we have a movement, uh, it's important this movement is not just focused on, on uh, like lobbying, for example. I think it's really important that we have a culture, um, you know, so visual culture, music that, you know, we, we have now more and more women coming to, um, to the gender critical movement with, uh, you know, with all sorts of background. We've got dancers, we've got ceramists and all sorts of uh, different artists. And I think it's really important to represent that visual culture. Um, I think it's it's really important to be visual and to to represent politics in a visual way because it's a very accessible mean. Um, we are in a very like image satur saturated culture. Uh, people barely have time to read these days. Um, reading is also quite an elitist activity. Not everybody, you know, has access to. Um, or, or will the, you know read theoretical essays or academic work, and you can spread a lot of message and you can spread a lot of uh, politics through images. I think in a very very effective way, very direct way, which I think yeah is is really one of the reasons I do I do that. I can carry on for much longer. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, I would love for you to, but um, yeah, I think that's such a good point that a lot of people are really captured by, for example, memes that they see on the internet. Those can be really powerful. And so some, and slogans and things can really get people thinking. And then that can be a path to further thought and activism. Exactly. So, so the aim is to kind of really capture, you know, feminist iconography to, to bring these images in a very clear, direct, uh, uncompromising way as much as possible and to be very, very woman-centered as much as possible and lesbian-focused, of mm -hmm. course. 
And so how did you actually sort of start up your shop and how do you run it? Like, it's just, it's just you, right? It's all you. Yeah. So I have a good friend called Leanne Timmerman. And uh, one day she was like, come on, Angela, you know, you know, you want to do this. And she actually bought me my first badge machine. I was um, at the time, not well. I was, um, uh, I was recovering from a very abusive relationship. My self-esteem was extremely low. I didn't have the confidence I needed to start a business like that. And it was really great that she actually was like, you know, bad machine, get on with it now, go to work. So, you know, I, I started like this very small. I was started by doing uh, badges. I didn't make t-shirts at the beginning. I had a, a, a little range of mugs and just things that I could manage at home. Um, and also that was really good because being self-employed and being recovering and healing, it was great because I had that um, uh, flexibility where, you know, if I'm not feeling well one day, I can work at night, I can work another day, you know, you can't do that when you're employed. So that was the the starting point. And then little by little, I grew, I was like, you know, I remember the days where I was like, oh my God, I would love to have a t-shirt range. And that was like a massive challenge and uh, and just learning little by little what the business is about how i function in uh, in doing this what's the it's not easy for women to to kind of promote themselves and their work so find your tone you know get confident enough to to do that um so it's been uh, almost five years now so i'm starting to know what i'm doing a little bit more uh, <laughs> i think do you have an artistic background i mean like I, I remember, for example, um, one day when you were having a conversation with J.K. Rowling and she asked you for a T-shirt and then you made it that night. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously you're able to draw, you know, lovely designs in a very short time. Do you did you go to art school? Yeah, I, I've always drawn like I'm the kid that used to stay at, uh, you know, in class when everybody used to play outside and I was drawing all the time. Um, I have a traditional training in visual art and I have a, a few other degrees in fashion design, interestingly. Um, I'm a creative pattern cutter and I also uh, I've got uh, hands on like direct experience as a graphic designer. And when you work in a graphic design agency, you know, you've got customer, they come on Friday and they're like, I want to design for yesterday. So you learn to, to work very, very fast. Um, so that's, you know, why I'm able to do this now because I was trained like this. Um, but when I, I left the industry because it was incredibly sexist, I was in a, in a very, very um, abusive, exploitative agency. There was a very small agency at the time in Paris. And uh, I was the only woman in the in the agency, and it was my job, for example, to Photoshop women's bodies and faces. That was I was appointed as that was me, uh, and there was like a lot of sexual exploitation in there. It was horrible. So when I left after five years, I decided I would never again do any kind of graphic work unless it was something I believed in. So for a very long time, I didn't do anything until I found my spot. Really, that's amazing. Um, and how do you come up with the ideas for your designs? Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of, they come, they kind of come. Um, it's not, a, it's, it's kind of a very organic pr like process. I don't really slave for it. It just is really natural and nice. Um, I think as much as you can train to have the skills to draw and paint and do this kind of thing, you also have a range of skill to make sure your creativity is always sharp and you're ready to roll. Um, so I do a lot of work around making sure my creativity is um, active. <laughs> um, mainly, there are themes that interest me always. Um, the witch is something that, you know, I've always been obsessed with. I'm going to carry on doing witches for the rest of my life, probably, uh, because there are some iconography that are women own that, that are our own. Um, so there's a range of themes that I'm just, you know, naturally interested as a feminist and as a woman. Um, and the witch is one of them, for example. Yeah. So what's your like general process for the shop, like what's what's sort of like a typical day or week or month like, whichever whichever of those uh, units of time it would make most sense to discuss. Okay, um, I I am processing all my orders myself, um, so I do a lot of packaging. 
Um, and I, I'm thinking, shall I carry on? And in fact, there's a part of me that really likes that day-to-day -day routine, having you know a good sense of who the customers are, the flow of what is going on, um, where the order's coming from. You know, like there's there's something really nice about this, um, even though it's not the most creative aspect of the work. And sometimes it can be it take me months to get over them. Um, but I do spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, ordering, admin, you know, like running a business thing. And um, when I have time, I design something new, <laughs> which is, is not something that takes the most time, interestingly, um, because I design quickly. Um, it's, it's also a lot of reacting to what's happening online. Sometimes there's, uh, yeah, something that catch my attention online where, I'm, oh, you know, this would make a good t-shirt and then immediately the image is in my head. So I would just start doing it. Um, I get, I get also called a lot like, oh, you know, you need to come like JK Rowling did the other day, but I do get a lot of requests. And in fact, the witch doesn't burn t-shirt was a friend who requested me to do a badge that said this and then. I made a lino cut that's, uh, you know, with the, with that, and uh, then it became a t-shirt, and that's it. So in terms of the 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 time of type of technique I use, it's not um, that there's there's some stuff I really like, but it's it changes all the time because it really depends what I want to do, and so I do a lot of lino cut. Um, I love stencil at the moment. I'm stenciling a lot, a lot of things that I'm not even showing, just work for me. Um, I love watercolor and I do a lot of work on the computer. And how do you know how many of each thing to make so that, because I'm sure, you know, you're putting your own money into creating the, the physical object. So do you sort of wait until you get a certain number of orders to then have them produced or do you have a back stock? How do you decide how to do that? So, the, the technology on t-shirts has really evolved recently. Um, when I, uh, well, yeah, a few a few years ago, like maybe fifteen years ago, <laughs> um, you had um, mainly if you contacted design uh, t-shirt uh, t-shirt printers, you would have um, screen print, and to to print screen print, you have to have big runs. Otherwise, it's not worth it. You cannot just print one. Um, or you can, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. So for a small company like me doesn't work because as you say it's a big gamble let's say if i order 250 t-shirts and i'm not selling them right. what am i going to do with them and also you know you need the space um but there's uh, now uh something called digital print where it's basically direct to garment they just print like on your on your printer at home it's really really good quality it's better and it doesn't cost more to print one and to print 50. So I start always with small run and that allows me to be really less uh, precious about things. You can just try a design, it doesn't work. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Do you know what I mean? It's not a yeah. massive investment because as I, as I say, when I started, I could not, now I have a bit more like a better cash flow, but I, as I started, I had nothing at all. So, right. you know, <laughs> right, so, yeah. Yeah. exactly. So that, that works like that where I uh, I have to have suppliers that are, quick and um, that uh, can deliver me quickly when I have a, a rush, which I do often. So yes. And they ship them, they ship everything to you and then you ship it. Yes. To yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had any suppliers um, care about the content of what you're printing on the Yes, I've the lost screen? a few. Yeah. I've lost a few suppliers. Um, that, uh, yeah, of course, called me hateful and bigoted and transphobic. I'm not going to go and name them because that would give them too much attention. Um, but it's their loss. <laughs> I've also lost uh, my platform on Etsy because I had uh, badges that say protect women's spaces or support the transitioners. And they thought it was just too extreme. Um, so they basically made me promise that I won't do it again. And so it means it meant that when I was building my website, I had a bit of like I had actually a few months where I had no trading because I had no platform and I was building my website and um, I kind of went okay right I promise I won't do it again even though I have no idea what it is <laughs> you don't want me to do because I don't think it's offensive it isn't um, and then JK Rowling tweeted my first t-shirt and then I decided to close my Etsy shop because I didn't want them to profit from that I mean yeah, you know maybe for sure 
you yeah, they don't them, deserve uh, to. They don't deserve to profit any, from it. Any sense of integrity in their madness, they wouldn't, uh, you know, profit from turf money, right? So, <laughs> so I closed the, I closed that shop. And so you built your own website. Did you do that yeah. on your own as well? You figured out. No. How to I had some help. I'm not. A, I'm not okay. a web developer. No way. <laughs> Okay, so there are some limits to your talent. <laughs> <laughs> Loads. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. And and where do you see yourself taking Wild Woman Workshop in the in the future? Do you have uh, different yeah. goals than what you're doing now? I've got plans. I I want to um right now in terms of content i think i do too much gender critical stuff not enough radical feminist stuff i want to refocus on women i want to uh yeah do proper radical feminist not that i don't but you know more radical feminist stuff less maybe less reaction to the media and and uh, more um in-depth uh, <laughs> kill your rapist type of <laughs> I don't know, like some classic rad femme things I like. Um, and in terms of what I'm doing, I, I love t-shirts because they're really, um, as I said, they're really accessible, you know, like you can, it's, it's a piece of art for 20 quid and you can wear it. And, you know, your gallery as an artist, it means my gallery is in the street, which, you know, yeah. it's amazing. Just it's very again. radical and revolutionary. Exactly. And not, and not elitist and who goes to gallery. I mean, I love museums and stuff. I used to before I was a feminist and, and, but it's still, you know, like a lot of people don't go to museum and to galleries to see images. So I think it's amazing to be able to have that you know, walking galleries outside. Yeah. But uh, I feel a bit frustrating in terms of size and I am now looking at walls. I would like to do murals. So this is a call out. <laughs> if you have a wall, <laughs> you would like me to paint, I'll, I'll be gladly doing that. Oh, um, fantastic. It's I love also, murals. Yeah, inside or outside, you know, because I, I'm getting so frustrated. I don't know if you have that in America, but in the UK, we've got all these crazy, um, LGBT flags painted all over the place, you know, on the floor. Oh, we don't have that here yet. I've seen those in like your crosswalks and stuff like yes, that. Yes, exactly. Yes. I'm happy to say we don't have that here <laughs> so far. I feel like this ideology, this belief system is like taking over the public space and we pay for it with our taxes and we don't have a say on, you know, what is being painted there. No. And, uh, and I'm really fed up. When are we going to see a Labrys flag? You know, not never. So, never. you know, yeah. if, if there were walls available, you know. <laughs> well, maybe I'm going to have to fundraise to bring you over here and paint a wall here. <laughs> I would love that. When, when it gets a bit quieter on the t-shirt front, I will, I will yeah. make that happen because I really want, I really yeah. want it. Well, I love what you said about um, wanting to do, to, to focus on radical feminist issues other than gender criticism, because I, I really, it very much bothers me how that's taken over all radical feminist discourse, because it's, it's not a radical feminist issue. It's, it's really a diversion from radical feminist issues. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I sort of consciously in my work and my everyday life and my conversations, try to talk about other things and not focus on you know, the trans industry and all that mm -hmm. um, all the time. And so actually one other thing you said that I really liked was um, the idea of having like women revolutionaries on t-shirts. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. If there are images that are in the public domain, you know, like who wouldn't, I like, would love like an Andrea Dworkin shirt with a quote from Andrea Dworkin or, you know, so there's so many feminists who said incredible things that you could make just endless t-shirts yeah. with like a line drawing of them and a quote that would be so awesome yeah what i've got i've got it working and i wanted um to put an audrey lord quote it's uh, uh, unfortunately not always possible because audrey lord for example um uh, audrey lord estate doesn't give the right to do merchandise with her quote so you have to be careful with this kind of thing as well but yeah um i used to actually and maybe i'm gonna start again i had a range of t-shirt with women's faces mm. Mm. Um, well, I wanted to ask you about um, your local activism that you were mentioning. You said this is kind of a newer thing for you, and, and I wanted to hear about what you've been doing locally. Yes, the, um, it's, it's, um, it's not something I came up with. A lot of uh, women in the UK have been doing that because the elections um, just happened. And so there was a lot of street activism. <clears throat> 
which we have been part of here, uh, where you would basically find a little gang, you know, like three, four is a good number, more is better, and uh, get a little table in a street corner with a suffragette flag and a couple of flyers, and then we just um, spend a few hours in the street. Somebody would turn up with a dinosaur costume and uh, we engage with um, with people we engage mainly with women um, just giving them flyers and see if they want to speak more you know we explain that it's about women's rights a lot of this has been around the fact that um, in the UK uh, we've had a few politicians who were not able to define what a woman was so it was you know easy to kind of engage on that um, because it's so obviously stupid <laughs> And a lot of people have actually heard of it. So yeah. that's a really good, um, that, that's been really good. We are hoping to get some more, even though it's not the election anymore, because I think it's a very direct way to communicate with women, to discuss with women, to raise awareness. Um, and we had done this a few years ago when uh, there was some plans to change the GRA. And the, what I see, the difference that I see now, a few years down the line, is that we have much more engagement. Women are much more aware. Women are angry. Okay. They are thanking us for being here. We've had, I mean, you know, we're talking really small, sorry, really small town in the rural wells. And, you know, it's not nothing fancy or, or extreme, but we've had women giving us like five or like money to support us to print flyers and things like this so i think there's a, a more awareness in the population which means that as a feminist movement we've done a good job into raising these issues yeah you know, that's great extreme. but i think we should really not dismiss the the groundwork of going to streets and speaking to women in the real world like mm -hmm. yeah what are your thoughts on sort of grassroots activism versus um, sort of working to get legislation changed or sort of main, more mainstream kind mm. of activism? Yes, I am not that like, okay, for me, um, like the idea of writing a letter or going to speak to a man in a suit, you know, in parliament makes no sense at all. I just do not get it. Um, I'm, I'm, I have tried and it's like, uh, why am I doing this? You know, it's hello. Uh, would you mind, uh, you know, acknowledging we exist in the law? Like, <laughs> could, could you just make sure that there's a law that is like the law against rape is kind of implemented? Can we, you know, <laughs> it makes no sense to me to go and ask people in power, men in power, um, for just basic recognition of our rights they should know better if they don't know it means they don't give a shit and not only they go but they i i don't see the point of doing that it's feel very very self-defeating to put it this way um and i know we, we had this conversation uh, previously i i think that if we need something it's much more efficient to do it ourselves to get it ourselves um, then to ask, oh, could I please get some funding for a rape crisis center? And then, you know, they might say yes, they might say no. If you're really lucky, they say yes. Then they put all sorts of different kind of um, um, limitations and conditions. You can only do this if you accept men. And what about many dresses and so on? And, and from the beginning, it's, it might feel like a victory if you get some funding, but actually from the beginning, you're tied to a patriarchal system and an institution that's going to control what you do and the way you do it. And then who's to say that in five years, they're not going to take it away. So, which, they, which is what they're doing now. <laughs> which is what they're doing now, exactly. And the same, the same thing about the abortion laws. I know it's a massive blow what's happening in the US. I'm not dismissing that. It's absolutely horrible, yeah. It's just horrendous. And it just shows you how, what a bad idea it is to put anything about our rights in men's hands. Mm. You know, it's like we gave you abortion and now we're going to take it away. Well, abortion was something that was only done by male doctors in the last hundred years. It was before that it was something that women controlled and took care of ourselves for thousands of years. And we honestly never should have given it over. I mean, we gave it over to men at the same time that we gave childbirth um, process over to men. And that was also a mistake. Mm. And so, yeah, I think that women need to be doing a couple of things. One, not having sex with men. Obviously. <laughs> unless, obviously you know, unless they want babies. <laughs> right? 
right? Unless they want to have a baby with that man. Um, and two, taking our own reproductive rights back into our own hands and controlling our own bodies, not asking for permission to do it, but just doing it. And not yeah, asking absolutely. men, you know, to pass laws that they then repeal. You know, there's, so much in, there's so much in what you said that I, I, I want to go into, like, don't have sex with men. Yeah. Even if you want a baby, do you really want a baby? I mean, you know, motherhood is an institution that is there to oppress women. This is why abortion is now so difficult to get because they know once you're a mother whether you've wanted that motherhood or not you know you're less likely to be autonomous it's going to be much harder for you you're going to lose some income whatever you do so <laughs> don't have sex with men um and yes do it like we must learn to do stuff ourselves like it is really autonomy and independence to not ask your oppressor for authorization of things you are listening to WLRN. Yeah, yeah, I'm really done with that. Done, done with asking the oppressor, oppressor for permission. I, I feel like there's a lack of understanding of, oh, you know, I really, I, I want to go back to it because I really feel there's a lack of understanding when I speak to most feminist activists where they're like, oh, this is a victory because they didn't change the law. Like we had all these GRA things, Gender Recognition Act that they wanted to change. And then we campaigned, we campaigned, they didn't change the law. Everybody thought it's a victory. Come on, this is not a victory. <laughs> you know, first of all, it is not a victory, but also they might try again in five years. They might try again later we need to step away i think from thinking inside the patriarchal box we need to yeah. rebuild something else outside of it you can't change the system by constantly saying oh you know by trying to change it you don't change the system like that just like you don't change an abusive husband by asking him to be nicer yeah please so, stop abusing me yes can you please stop yeah stop raping me we know individually we we understand that individually but we don't understand it collectively and it's the same thing yeah absolutely the master's tools will never oh i'm gonna get the quote wrong we'll never dismantle the master's exactly what house yeah. no and oh so it's really interesting. It's like all, these, all these equality laws elizabeth that are there now dismantling women's rights they were there built for us they were there to to protect minorities they are part of a patriarchal system which is now built you know that, that those laws that were built to protect us are now destroying us this is always what's going to happen if you play with men's law right That's yeah i mean it, well it sort of shows like the parallel tracks of liberal feminist work and radical feminist work and i mean i do think there's a place for liberal feminist work like getting abortion laws and you know getting the vote and things like that like those are sort of stopgap measures that we need to have um, because we are in a patriarchal system and so we do need to have measures like that to make a place for us within the patriarchal system but that's only a temporary fix i mean ultimately we like just like you said we need to build things outside of that patriarchal box i feel, I feel that it can be box is never gonna work for us I feel that it can be a trap to even see it as a temporary measure because once we have this temporary measure, then we can relax, can we? This is what happened. Well, that's what happens. Yeah, that's often what happens. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's a real, it's a real tension. Yeah. Uh, because you need, you know, it's very well, at least in theory, it's very time consuming and difficult to build parallel systems for ourselves. And so I guess. The idea is that in the meantime, you know, we we do what we can to make the existing system palatable. Although honestly, maybe that's just giving up too easily. You know, maybe it's I feel it's a lack of it's a lack of creative thinking. I think it's a lack of being able to think outside, outside the, the box, generally speaking, not even outside patriarchy, but you know we can do things differently. We have a word in front of us. But what where do we want in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years? You know, do we still want to carry on fighting within that word? Or do we want to have built something new? What, what does it look like, this feminist vision? You know, does it look like going to parliament to argue? Yeah. And maybe it's part of our patriarchal conditioning that we don't believe we can make our own systems. 
Hmm. Because we can't. I mean, when women try, they always do it. You know, in women created entire, you know, record companies, um, you know. Yes, and press. Domestic violence shelters, all sorts of things. And, you know, the Jane Collective in Chicago uh, before Roe, you know, did abortions and they all, all of the abortions they did were safe. You know, whenever women take things into their own hands, they are capable of building these alternative systems that work. And so maybe we just have to know that and tell each other that and have confidence. Oh, I mean, I, on a very different level, I, I've learned on the late how to wallpaper crazy stuff like I've never learned as a kid even though my dad is a decorator nobody taught me and then one day a friend taught me how to wallpaper and then I thought what if men can do it surely you know we can do it too but like, it's the same what, what is it that is so special with you know repairing a car or you know having an abortion or giving birth <laughs> that if men can do it and they don't do it really well surely we can do it too yeah absolutely mm. Well, um, I want to ask you about a couple of other projects. You're just an endless project person. Um, so tell me about um, the Get the L Out UK project that you started and what you did, and then also the Lesbian Me Too project. Yes, so um, with Get the L Out, um, it started as not a project, really. It started with the fact that there was these conversations happening in the UK about uh, how transgenderism were, uh, was affecting women, generally speaking. But as lesbians, we felt that our specific experiences were not talked about. And <laughs> it was particularly frustrating because as lesbians, we have been targeted very directly, very intimately by trans activists from years, maybe much longer than straight women were because, you know, the cotton ceiling and the transitioning of lesbians are old stories now. And uh, we were, generally speaking, aware of this issue way before the, you know, mainstream or even straight feminists were. So it felt like really frustrating to be not able to pass our message across. And we were I mean, my feeling at the time that I was really desperate, I was like, we need to, there's an emergency, we need to speak about what's happening to lesbians, how do we do that? And then I saw this uh, picture of, um, I think it's Rene and Charlie in New Zealand uh, in 2018 or 17, who um, went to their local pride with a placard, a big, a big banner. Um, talking about this and I thought wow this is really inspiring and also they didn't seem to have been harassed on the day so I thought wow they live to tell the tale you know could we do this and the idea then was to um, yeah so so me and and Sarah uh, both had the same idea at the same time when we saw this image and we started to just start org organizing this action and we we, we, we are told sometimes that it was an action against pride, that it was a pride protest, and it was never that. You know, to go back to what we were saying, the, the point was never to discuss with pride in London or the LGBT. We, we were not discussing with the enemy. We wanted to use their platform so that we could access women. So it was always a lesbian-focused action. We wanted to, to talk to lesbians within the LGBT who go to pride, who don't go to pride, and tell them that there was voices of dissent that we were not, you know, happy with what was happening. Um, so that's that's how uh, it started. So we decided to confront the parade uh, and to block it and to lie down on the floor so that we had visibility, which we had. <laughs> and uh, and yes, yeah, so the idea was never to change Pride's mind because we, we know they wouldn't. Um, you know, if you want to change somebody's mind, you write them a letter, you don't do that. Um, but uh, I think in terms of accessing women and making sure women heard, um, it worked. So that, that was that. And then we did other actions of the same nature. We went to uh, Vienna, which is, uh, there was Euro Pride the year after, and we did Manchester and then Swansea, just the two of us, uh, Lian and myself, where I got pulled out <laughs> for having a banner that says that lesbians do not have a penis. So that's it. It's really mainly uh, a project of lesbian visibility. And then you published a report, right? Yes. And then uh, after that, I was at university and I, I had a, the opportunity to do a, um, 
a project that I could self-direct so I could pick up my own thing. So I I chanced it. I <laughs> just thought I want to do this. And I was very surprised that they accepted. Um, they I had to go through the ethic committee because there was some questionnaire involved and they were really supportive and they wanted me to do this. And so it was a report on the... Um, I'm sorry, this was at a university, like for a, a master's thesis or something? Yeah, it was a master's, yeah. Okay. It was a master's in women's study, which um, it still existed in 2019 and doesn't exist anymore uh, in the local university here in, in, uh, in Wales. Uh, they have closed the degree, which was part of the lifelong learning department. So imagine it, lifelong learning means you go and you do an MA. If you're a mother, if you're a single mom, if you're working full time, you can still do your thing because it's one course a week and it took three years to do an MA. So it's really working class, you know, making sure that uh, women and, uh, uh, you know, minorities and people who work can still access an education. They close the whole thing down. And they not only closed the whole thing down, they closed the whole thing down where we were still studying in it. So we had to be shifted to another department. They sacked the head of the course. It was like such a violent ideological decision to do that in that way. I'm sorry, they, they closed um, the whole lifelong learning program yeah, or just yeah. the women's studies part? No, all of it. The oh. whole lifelong, yeah. So why? Do you know why? There was no there was no financial reason because it was a popular course it did well so we can only only presume that you know i think again you know the men uh, think the, the men take back what they think is theirs that their education system their university and when you're there you're gonna <laughs> you know learn about gender theory now not women's study it was a wonderful course it was really amazing so do they have a gender theory course now? Or they no, just don't have the program at all? They don't have the program at all. There were talks about opening a gender in literature, which I don't think they did. And then I lost interest in the thing and I, I don't know what they have now. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, it was, <laughs> it was a research on the cotton ceiling, which is the raping and the coercion of lesbians by men who identify as trans. Um, and the why I did it again is because there was you know, an LGBT movement who is basically ignoring the fact that this is happening uh, or saying, oh, we don't have the research. There's no research about it. So it doesn't exist. So I thought, well, you know, obviously, if you're not doing the research, there's not going to be a research. So I just thought, I have no means. It's a kitchen table work. I'm going to do it with what I've got. Um, and I um, sent a questionnaire. I got 80 responses of lesbians around the world who taught me about their experience of being pressured into accepting men as sexual partners. And so far to date, it's still the only research on the topic that I know of. Wow. But the, your lesbian me too research is, is related to that same issue. Yes. yes. So uh, on the side of that last year in May, uh, we launched a website called lesbian me too. And it was about, first it was about recording uh, experiences of a lesbian when it comes to sexual violence. And then we realized that for lesbians, violence is not the same. It's, it's not necessarily always sexual. Uh, there's a lot of very direct physical violence directed at lesbians that maybe straight women do not encounter. So we opened it to any kind of violence. Um, and the idea was to not only show that there were issues with cotton ceiling, obviously that there were stories that there were more stories with cotton ceiling, but to show the range of the oppression that has been faced, uh, into which cotton ceiling is one of them. Um, so we've been running this project for a year. I have uh, decided to step away a little bit um, for several reasons that I'm not going to get into, and the project is run now by Sarah, I think we might well be able to do uh, a good uh, research work out of it because there is now more than a hundred testimonies on there. Mm -hmm. That's great. So That's there great. Would, really so much data. One of the, one of the, yeah, I mean, the, you know, it really tells you there is nothing done about lesbian, uh, you know, research about lesbians, uh, lesbian lives and, uh, you know, experience of oppression. So it would be something really powerful. Yeah, well, that's reminding me of um, the the researcher at Brown who did um, 
who collected surveys on rapid onset gender dysphoria and wrote a report and nothing had ever been done in that area. Um, and of course she was totally dismissed and harassed at first, but now it's become an accepted theory and I see it in a lot of places. I see it being referred to in other academic work. Mm -hmm. And so it's really heartening to see um, how much impact women can have on the wider culture uh, when we just, you know, do do the work, put the effort in. Definitely. I, I think it's one thing, like if if any anybody who's listening has, has ideas about things that they could do, then you should really trust your gut feeling and do them. You know, if you, you know, if you see there's something missing that you could be doing, then you should be doing it. Try to do it. Yeah, that's basically the way all feminist work starts, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what you were saying about, um, you know, men giving working class women this, uh, this opportunity to study and then just taking it away reminded me of um, what WDI is doing, the Women's Declaration International, how they've been having weekly, um, they call it feminist question time, but it's really basically university seminars <laughs> with women from all over the world. And they're yes. basically creating their own university which Absolutely. I think is just incredible and wonderful. Yes, there's two things actually that happen. There's like women internationally who speak on a Saturday and then on Sunday, there's also sometimes an, um, work, feminist work that is being read and analyzed. I, I, I yes. don't watch it live, but I often listen to it when I work and I really recommend it. It's, uh, the Saturday is more like, oh, current affairs, what's going on in the, in the world. Um, the Sunday one is more like kind of, theoretical in-depth things just watch it yeah yeah I really love that women you know are just sort of like well you know men don't want us in their their little exclusive club so we'll just make our own which and of course is forbidden it's forbidden but you know <laughs> you're not allowed to do that <laughs> you're not allowed to do that but they're doing it anyway and of course it's much better than anything that would be in a male university anyway yeah yeah absolutely well yes of course I mean, I, I study women's, uh, Welsh women's history. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. And it, it has no, you can't, it's no equivalent to what you call history, what is really male's history. You know, it was not about dates and battles and, you know, what law was being passed. It was about what women's lives were like. And, you know, we have so little knowledge because so much is being destroyed and yeah. oh, we just need to rebuild all this. Yeah. Well, since I was a kid, I've always thought it was so strange that what was called history was things like who was the king and this battle and that battle. It was like that impacted a few people. You know, why is that what's called history? Like, why aren't we talking about, you know, massive social movements and what impacted, you know, everybody in a certain country or everybody on earth? Like, that's, that's indeed, what yeah. history should be. That's what mm -hmm. should be studied. Yeah. All right. Well, anything else that you want to go back and fill in any detail about? Oh, one. Oh, sorry. I just remembered a question I wanted to ask on your activism tables. What do you have? What sorts of things do you have on your flyers? What kinds of topics do you put on there? What we do on the table. Oh, we we don't come up with them. We uh, we there they are now in the UK a hell of a lot of groups, which is really amazing. <laughs> and so we order them. There was uh, we used some from Sex Matters, you know, Maya Foster's uh, organization during the elections. Uh, there's a, a group called the Women's Right Network, which is like UK wide, where they have groups everywhere, and they come up with some uh, literature and little flyers, which is really helpful. Uh, yeah, we do have some um, some local one. It's, I would say, if you're planning to do this, um, try to keep it really simple. Simple as in you can't put everything on a flyer. Not not simplistic, but simple. Like you know, put bullet points of how you think transgenderism is affecting women, especially around you, and bullet points that and and use it as a starting point for the conversation. It doesn't have to be an essay. Um, it, you know put a nice logo and then some uh, some bullet points that's that's yeah how we how we do it and what we stand for mm -hmm. 
like principles so like statistics and then principles yeah yeah you can say you know like transgenderism is affecting women in prison women in sport lesbian in, in that way and so on and then we stand for you know the fact that uh well, men are not women and you cannot change sex, for example, or just, you know, in, in very simple terms. And don't think that, again, if you're not an academic, you cannot write a flyer, um, you know, sit down, look at what's being done around and uh, and what are they, how, how, you know, how these issues are affecting you and put that down on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So any other plans for the future? Because I know you probably have a lot of free time on your hands that you need. To <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I have plans, but um, no, apart from the mural uh, in, in kind of um, art um, things, there's, I, I can't really, I can't really tell you more. Um, any other detail you wanted to fill in about any of the other things that we talked about? Uh, fill in, no, I would really like to encourage women to, to, to trust their instinct and to do stuff. And, you know, to, you know, it, as I said, if there is something you see that is not being talked about, but is affecting you or women, you know, be that one who's going to talk about it. You know, this is how it starts. This is why I did the cotton seeding, because I thought, oh, you know, somebody's going to talk about this. And nobody did. So it's like a little bit when you're in a meeting and so, you know, they're like, it's a question time. And when I was 18, I was like, oh, I'm going to wait until somebody asks the question. And nobody asked the question that you want to ask. So you have to be the one bringing these issues. If you see something, trust yourself, you know, and, and, um, and be the one who brings, who brings it. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. I completely agree. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Angela. It's always great to hear about what you're doing you're always doing so much and it's always fun to talk to you thank you so much thank you for your time and uh, a lot of the things i do are actually really pleasurable so it's really nice <laughs> i just want to say yeah, you know that's important too it doesn't have to it's be painful too. you know what i mean <laughs> yeah that's very important that you love that you're doing things because you want to and because you love doing them exactly Okay, thank you. All right, well, thanks for everything. I hope you enjoyed this segment of Getting Organized, an activist primer with Elizabeth Miller. The next segment set to drop in August, Elizabeth will interview Don Smith, the founder and organizer of Michigan Framley Reunion a women's music festival that she was inspired to start after Michigan Women's Music Festival ended in 2015. Please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great content like this, additional interviews, podcasts, and other grassroots media coverage of events that focuses on issues affecting women. Or hop on over to our website, womensliberationradionews.com, and sign up for a newsletter to not miss any of our stellar content. This is WLRN Canadian member April No signing off for now.